Today's show is sponsored by Fauna. Fauna is the data API for modern applications. As application architectures evolve to embrace cloud APIs and microservices, you need a database that is always correct, always fast, and always secure. But you don't want to spend valuable time managing your database. Fauna modernizes your OLTP infrastructure by providing a 100% operations-free database without compromising on the capabilities needed for building industrial-grade enterprise applications. Whether you're building new microservices or augmenting existing services applications, FaunaDB lets you simplify code, reduce costs, and ship faster. Fauna is a Jepson verified, globally distributed OLTP database delivered as an API that works with the programming language of your choice. To learn more, visit fauna.com slash cloudcast to try it for free. That's F-A-U-N-A dot com forward slash cloudcast to learn more and try it for free. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We're coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Just Aaron this week, um, and for Cloud News of the Week, actually, it's a bit of a slow week. Uh, So we're going to breeze through uh, just a, a couple ones that we found interesting as well, and... For those of you here in the United States, this is uh, Thanksgiving week. And so for many of you, a little bit of uh, time to unplug and certainly wish everyone the best and and hope everyone is staying safe. So let's go ahead and jump into the first article. Our first article is an acquisition. IBM um, has acquired an AI company, um, Instana. And um, for this... Uh, this is all about AI, but AI kind of meets observability, if you will. So how do you take uh, performance metrics and, and application metrics and kind of start to find the needles in the haystack through AI? Really, really interesting article um, in there. Um, and as we continue to follow this AI space, uh, of course, you know, we, we've had guests on the show in the, in the past and then in these natural kind of progressions in our industry, you, you know, folks get VC funding and then eventually um, go ahead and we start to see some exits as well. And so for our next article, um, it's actually the next two articles is really um, some interesting data that is coming out. Um, A couple surveys uh, basically were released in in time for KubeCom. The first survey is, uh, again, good friends of the show, Datadog. And this is 11 facts about real world container use. Uh, Pretty interesting. Um, a couple of them are kind of no brainers, right? Um, and then a couple of them that, that might surprise you, uh, just a little bit as well. So if you're interested in that, uh, the link is in the show notes and go take a look, uh, for the second survey I mentioned is from the cloud native foundation. So there is, uh, um, they did a survey of well as well. And the headline in particular jumped out, uh, to me, and that is, Containers in production jump 300% um, in their first survey. And it kind of goes on from there. There's a, you know, a lot of data in this one. Um, and, you know, how are you, how are you using this? Are you using serverless technologies? Are you using service mesh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I really appreciated the, the kind of slicing and dicing into the different technologies, if you will. So again, if that is interesting to you, go take a look. And with that, we're going to jump on to our feature segment this, this week, which is all about data models. Today's show is sponsored by Cloud Academy. Listen up, y'all. This is a great offer. With everyone using the same cloud platforms, winning and losing comes down to having the best talent to build products better and faster. Cloud Academy is the training platform of choice for Fortune 500 companies and thousands of tech professionals around the world. Thousands of video courses, learning paths, practical hands-on labs in real-world cloud environments, Cloud Academy has tools designed to help teams assess, build, and validate critical cloud skills. Most importantly, Cloud Academy stays agile, challenging you with new content, labs, and tons of features that ensure your skills stay relevant and everyone can level up. They cover everything from cloud certifications to DevOps to security to programming languages. You can get started now at cloudacademy.com. 
For a limited time, Cloudcast listeners can lock in 50% off the monthly price for life. Just put in the coupon code CLOUDCAST at checkout. It's a great way to pursue certifications or just build cloud expertise. Again, that's cloudacademy.com and use the coupon code CLOUDCAST to lock in 50% off the monthly price. Today's show is sponsored by Datadog, a cloud-scale monitoring platform that unifies metrics, logs, and traces from technologies like Istio, AppMesh, and Envoy. Plus, Datadog's service map automatically plots out the dependencies in your microservices architectures for seamless, context-rich troubleshooting. With rich visualizations, algorithmic alerting, and more than 250 vendor-supported integrations, Datadog allows you to monitor your distributed applications in real time. Start a free 14-day trial today by visiting datadog.com cloudcast and Datadog will send you a great free t-shirt. That's datadog.com slash cloudcast. And we're back. And folks, you know, as you know, we've been talking about kind of all the different ways that that companies have been, uh, you know, dealing with the pandemic here over the last, what is it now, six, seven months. And, you know, we've seen different types of industries, different types of projects kind of accelerate. Some have gotten slowed down. And one that we've seen, you know, obviously, is is I get a chance to talk to a lot of different companies um, that doesn't seem to slow down is their projects around AI and ML and, and things that they're using to either more automate uh, things that they do all the time. So they want to gain an advantage, a cost advantage, but but almost as importantly, they're using it to personalize their applications. They're seeing more and more stuff that's being driven by mobile and, and, and data behind that. So I uh, really kind of want to dig into that a little bit more and, and talk to some folks who bring a lot of expertise in this space. So very excited to, to you know, as, as you know, we love to talk to new companies. So excited to talk to um, a new company that's been out for about six, eight months or so now. Uh, and want to introduce their uh, CEO and, and co-founder, Mike Del Balso. Uh, Mike is CEO of Tecton AI. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So, um, you know, as I've mentioned, we we love having a chance to talk to new companies, startup companies. You guys have been around for a little bit under a year, um, but you bring a lot of really interesting background, not only with Tecton, but also from some of the work you've done at, at Uber. Give folks a little bit of, of your background, kind of as an introduction and, and some of the work that, that you've been doing at Uber that really led you to start Tecton. Got it, yeah. Um, well, I, I think the kind of DNA of our team is really around uh, very applied machine learning work. So, um, you know, when we see people doing like machine learning or AI in organizations, there's there's often uh, a, a a couple of different ways in which it happens. Some some companies actually have uh, like specific AI ML research teams. Mm-hmm. Some companies um, are trying to to in, in to kind of infuse their products with AI or machine learning. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then and then it's also quite common to just like use machine learning to help in, internal investigations, internal insights, bu- business intelligence stuff, and. Um, and you know my background and the the founding team's background is really just on the the really applied uh, side of things. That second bucket with around putting machine learning, powering your products with machine learning, powering your customer experiences with machine learning. Um, we call that operational machine learning. And uh, you know I kind of got into this uh, actually when I started working at Google. I uh, was a product manager that ran the. Uh, machine learning models. I was responsible for the machine learning models that power Google's ads auction. Oh, wow. So it was, yeah, it was like, I mean, like gigantic scale, super important models that, you know, they can't go down and they have to be very accurate and very financially important to the business. And so uh, this is, you know, uh, 2013 to 2015 kind of time frame, And, um, and so we had great, great tools and great processes there, and and you know, uh, amazing engineering team, obviously, but but uh, like really good processes that I think today, you know, that's the kind of stuff we call ML ops in this space. And uh, so I, I know after working at Google and working on probably some of the largest machine learning models in the world uh, and very applied, uh, obviously, uh, joined Uber and at Uber. It was still the early days for Uber, so there wasn't much machine learning in production. Uh, but the goal was, like, let's figure out machine learning for Uber. That was kind of my job. And so that was a kind of a different story. It, it, instead of being, you know, at probably the top machine learning organization in the world, uh, we were, you know, starting starting all over again. And how, how are we going to bring machine learning excellence to, to Uber? And, and that was really something we saw as a, 
a competitive advantage for Uber. All this data we had, you know, how, what can we do with it? And so we um, built out some, so, so at the time, there was a variety of, of problems that the team had uh, that, that every data scientist faced, you know, uh, d- uh, tools that weren't like disconnected tools, si- siloed data, you know, there wasn't really a path to production. And, uh, and so data scientists just weren't getting their stuff. They either weren't building machine learning models or they would build them and they weren't, wouldn't be able to actually put them in production and power the Uber product with it. And so um, we built out this, this centralized platform. Like we kind of started the centralized machine learning team at Uber. Uh, and we built out this platform called Michelangelo. And that's really this uh, end-to-end it's one of the, I guess, one of the first like real like end-to-end operational machine learning platforms. And so the goal of that was to allow data scientists to uh, come to this platform, bring their business problem, translate it to a machine learning problem, build a model, evaluate that model, you know, go through the whole life cycle all the way to uh, deploying a model into production and operating in production on their own. So the goal is really to look to provide like a self-service. You know, we talked a lot about democratizing machine learning and um, and uh, and that was something that we were quite successful with at Uber. You know, we went from, in a period of two, two and a half years, we went from just a handful of models to tens of thousands of models in production. And uh, and so that's, you know, a pretty, pretty good success story. There's a lot of organizations trying to go through, you know, that's, they would love to go through a similar kind of journey. And, um, and so that's part of like the background of, of our team. Just mention that briefly, just to kind of give a sense of, uh, you know, we've always focused on operational machine learning. How do you use it for your product? How do you use it to solve applied business problems that affect the customer experience? Not so much like internal analyses. And so that's where some of our background comes from. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting. And I know even when you guys first launched, I had sort of dug into some of this. I, one of the, the things that, that you guys talk about at, at Tecton AI is this idea that, that uh, you know, great models need great features. And I, I think mm-hmm. what, what really kind of was a, interesting to me was it feels like, so, you know, there's always lots of companies that go, we, we deliver technology. And, and oftentimes customers are then sort of stuck with, well, that's great. It's powerful, but but what do I do? Like, how do I use it? How do I make it an everyday thing? Can you talk a little bit about kind of this idea that you have of of, of making models kind of readily available for people, but then also some? How do you take some of that learning you had at, at Uber in terms of like how you drew the teams into using them? How you found that collaborative way to to bring them to the platform and want to use the platform? Yeah, great. Um... Yeah, there's a couple of things to unpack there. You know, the big thing is we really focus on, so, uh, you know, we really focus on helping teams get a complete machine learning application into production. So we see, you know, so many teams struggle with uh, uh, trying to, you know, infuse their product with machine learning. And when we go talk to the team, the data scientist says, hey, I've had this model. I built this model like six months ago. And I'm just kind of waiting around for the IT guys or the engineering team to put this thing into production. And we're kind of just waiting for like some data to be available or for someone to rewrite a pipeline or something. And, uh, and so, you know, when, when you look at putting a machine learning application in production, you, there's kind of two parts to it. There's the model itself, but there's also these, these data pipelines that feed the right data, which is what's called the features to the model. So when we say, you know, great models need great features, it's, it's also kind of like saying garbage in, garbage out which is a common thing people see in machine learning. And, and, um, and so we, I think we made pretty good strides solving a lot of these problems uh, at Uber. And this is really what inspired us to build Tecton. So, so at Uber, we kind of went through this like process of like a Cambrian explosion of machine learning. And, uh, and that's how we got to, you know, so many models in, in production. But what, what actually happened there, you know, we looked back and thought like, hey, what did we actually get right? What did we get wrong here? The, the two things that I think we got really, really right, one, a fast, like one-click path to production for anything that's defined in this, the system, the Michelangelo system, you know, it's already productionized, basically. There's not an extra productionization step. Just the framework, uh, the framework that you develop in is a production framework. Secondly, um, everything that is defined in that system 
becomes reusable for an, uh, the next use case. So it was kind of collaboration and reusability built into that, uh, built into the whole system. And uh, that was really like this catalyst for scaling machine learning across the organization. And, you know, we did that both for the models and the, da- the, the machine learning specific data pipelines. Um, what we do at Tekton, so the machine learning specific data pipelines are these, you know, feature pipelines. And so what we do at Tekton is we build a uh, essentially a whole platform just for those pipelines. You know, there's a lot of tools out there today to organize and manage and train and deploy models. We see very, very few tools in the in the uh, basically in the adjacent space of the, uh, focus on these feature pl- uh, these feature pipelines to uh, power these models, give them the important signals that they need, these predictive signals that they need to make their predictions. And so, what we're building at Tekton is really an uh, an end-to-end management platform, uh, quite analogous to Michelangelo, really focused on the data engineering challenges uh, for. Uh, for building machine learning systems and putting them into production, um, so that's kind of like the the layer that we're playing at, and that's how it's it's uh, uh, very relevant to um, you know it's analogous to, to Michelangelo in, in that sense where we're reusing a lot of the same um, kind of lessons that we learned that made the that made it successful to scale uh, machine learning across uh, across Uber, but certainly like the features are at the core of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I know as I was kind of reading about this and, and sometimes if you're not living in the system, you don't realize maybe how complex or sophisticated they are. And as I was kind of reading about the experience you guys had, uh, things like Uber Eats and others, it, it dawned to me there was, it, you know, it's not just sort of AI takes in a bunch of data, it analyzes it, it makes, you know, pops out a decision and you're done. It's it's very much this layered idea of you know one decision then informs another one or um, things are happening in real time. You have to make adjustments. You know as you're as you're getting a chance to talk to companies and, and now we're seeing you know lots of stuff happening because of the pandemic. Are people starting to grasp that you know the the power of of having these layered sort of decisions or layered levels of data and and your ability to to help them you know, it both integrate them, but also use them to make better decisions or better customer interactions? Yeah, it's, it's both, you're right. It's both the, um, the kind of cascaded decision making. So, you know, one model makes a decision, let's say it's like a fraud model, right? So one model will, or rather, let's say your system is predicting, uh, is should, should we allow this transaction to happen? And you might have one model that, that predicts, does this look like an unusual amount uh, like transaction size for for this merchant, let's say, and then that might be a signal you want to feed into a next model, which might say, uh, you know, so therefore, how sketchy does this whole transaction look overall? You know, that kind of cascaded decision making is is very common, and it's super hard to build. It's super hard to to manage in production. You know, we have a customer who has. Uh, like literally like a, a complex system in production with hundreds of models. They all, you know, are depending on exactly what's happening in their business. They will activate certain ones for certain decisions and it all has to happen in real time. And so there's this kind of like cascaded real time decision making, but there's also, you know, what are the inputs to these models? Where does this data come from? It's it's also not as simple as just loading all of this data for a file from a file and just feeding it through these models. You know, you need these these signals, these features to be uh, to be as updated as possible, as fresh as possible to reflect the real real world scenario. And so, you know, there's there's cases where, like, uh, you know, sometimes you have data that doesn't need to be very fresh. You might have a, you know, for example, hey, where when did this user sign up with our service? That's not something you need to update all the time. And then you have uh, types of signals that might be kind of important to have pretty fresh. Like how many times did this person log in or enter the wrong password in the past 30 seconds kind of thing, right? So that's something where it can give you a, a really unique signal that you couldn't get from uh, something that you run on a daily basis. And then there's even signals that you want to defi- derive from fully real-time data. Like, you know, this person just put these inputs into the website and we're trying to determine a real-time price for them. Well, we have to act on exactly the inputs they gave us. Imagine this is like an insurance use case. Like, 
what you know what what kind of history did they just provide to us in real time and we've got to crunch this in real time and pass these to the models to determine uh the right price so there's the the challenge here is both a model and a data challenge and and the real kind of tricky thing is that these these kind of best practices for how to build these 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 complex applications that mix data and models together especially in real time they just don't exist and so uh, you know, these, these best practices are emerging right now. People are trying to figure out how to do it. Um, I, th I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, us to help, just like help people figure out how, how to approach it. Even if, even if it's like not about using our tools, it's just, just having the conversation uh, can go a long way because there's just not a lot of info out there. So uh, the concept of the, the concept of like productionizing this stuff, you know, building it in a collaborative way, Doing it with the right governance in mind, the right compliance, is super hard for organizations. It, it's just there's nothing out there to to uh, kind of drive that. And then and then finally, how do you let, allow data scientists to build this stuff in a way that the engineers will trust it to to run in an operational environment in production? These are like some very common challenges that people deal with when they're trying to build these multi-model kind of complex. AI use cases in production. That's the kind of scope of challenges that we help them out with. Yeah, no, that's, that's very cool. I, it, and a lot of it, you know, sounds like, um, not exactly, but, but similar to what we've seen with people that are, you know, gone from monolithic applications to, to microservices and you're making changes more frequently. When does the dev team stop? When does, you know, QA and production start? Do you find, I mean, obviously with these, with these, uh, you know, large data models, you know, in the past you had sort of data silos, you had data lakes, um, you know, teams sometimes had to go through big processes to even get access to it. The stuff you're talking about obviously impacts pricing and impacts customer satisfaction and impacts a lot of things that are very material. Like you can, you can put dollars and cents against them. Mm -hmm. Do you find that it, it's now sort of become uh, a driver to people organizing themselves so that they can be really efficient for this or, uh, you know, cause it feels like there's a part of this that's, yeah, get the technology right. But part of it's very much, how are you culturally working out? You know, how are you organized? How, how does your culture work to share things? Do you find that now that the tools are kind of there, it, it's driving people or, or how does that process tend to tend to work with folks? Yeah, there's an interesting tension. You know, the kind of broader data science community is very collaborative, uh, you know, it, uh, experimental, iterative in, in development. And, um, in, you know, a lot of the use case, a lot of the enterprise ma operational machine learning use cases, <clears throat> like well, imagine like an insurance use case or, mm -hmm. or uh, kind of like a financial crimes use case highly regulated and in those scenarios it's compliance first right it's it's governance is is priority number one and so there's a little bit of like cultural tension a lot of organizations are kind of at a standstill because they're they're trying to to reconcile the kind of best practice data science development processes with their actual like legal requirements you know we need every model to be uh we need, we need to log every experiment or we need uh every decision that we make to be properly documented and reproducible and data scientists you know coming from you know, uh, coming from grad school or something like that building building models there that's just not stuff that they spend time on so so there's there's a lot of opportunity to kind of bring those worlds together and provide uh, the analytics or data science teams uh, ways for them to still operate at the speed that they're used to such that they feel effective and empowered, but in a way that's done within this trustworthy environment such that the engineering teams, the IT teams can trust that whatever is built here is actually going to work. Like it's not going to, you know, it's not going to crash at scale. And secondly, that the compliance teams uh, or whoever is in charge of legal there is going to be is going to uh, feel satisfied that the right compliance uh, restrictions and uh, conditions are built into the process. Right. Uh, so that's like a, co a very common kind of like organizational thing, and I think there's um there's a big like there's there's some operational things uh, around kind of change management that are some of the most primary issues. You know, you mentioned. 
if someone changes something, then another person gets impacted and how do you share data? It's particularly a challenge in the machine learning space. Whereas, you know, if you have these models that depend on one another, when you have when you have one model, uh, you know, there's not one person building all of these models, right? So you have someone publish a model or a signal that is being used by someone else, it's reused by someone else in another part of the organization or just even someone else on your team. And when you change, you know, when you update that signal, you find a bug and you want to fix it, how do you manage those changes that, you know, that might break some downstream model that was actually de dependent on that specifically nuanced behavior of that old version of your signal. And if you update that, that could break a bunch of downstream behaviors or downstream models. So how do you kind of build that lineage and visibility into, uh, into the system to manage changes of these analytic applications in, the, in an appropriate way for uh, like compliant use cases? Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes, it makes sense. And obviously, you know, having, having the, the tool that essentially gives you, uh, you know, historical capabilities of that self-service into it, you know, all, all those become just as important, I would guess, almost as, as you know, the, the actual model itself. How do you, how do you live it through its life cycle? How do you find dependencies? How do you collaborate with people so that it's, it's easy to figure out uh, mm -hmm. what the dependencies are? Um, you guys, obviously, you, you launched the company earlier this year. Um, the world's gone through some interesting things. Have you found, um, you know, the, the things that people are using the platform for now are, are a little different than, than what you originally thought? Or did it accelerate certain capabilities that uh, maybe more so than others within the platform? Uh, I think, let me see, I, I think the... Our, our, you know, we've built a lot of this, the same kind of principles of a product before, you know, the, the founding team is the team that built this Michelangelo system at Uber. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think a lot of our original vision um, holds, we, we've stuck to that and, it, and it's holding true. But one of the things that we have, we have spent a lot of time digging into is just like, how, what is, how do you kind of balance between supporting an extremely wide variety of use cases, you know, in the, in the data space, people's data are coming from all kinds of places, they have all kinds of different tools that they prefer. And then secondly, how do you, and, and, then, and then how do you balance that against providing a really powerful framework just for a narrow set of use cases? Yeah. And so it's, uh, we, we're learning about use cases that we, we hadn't been exposed to before. And, you know, we're, we're happy that we have focused on cloud, on providing a cloud only managed service. So that provides some, uh, important constraints. You know, if you're on prem, sorry, we're, we're just not talking to you. That's not the, that that's not in our scope. However, uh, an interesting challenge is organizations who are on prem but are moving to the cloud and i mean you know i'm sure you talk to a ton of uh, a ton of organizations that help people make that transition what is the right place for an operational machine learning to to kind of uh take over in the cloud versus you know how do you manage how do you manage mach your machine learning organization when you're kind of split across on-prem in the cloud right it's something we coach a lot of organizations on yeah, well, and and I think if you had told people, I don't know, even twelve months ago, like, hey, we're only going to make a, we're, we're going to build an enterprise product, but we're only going to be, you know, in the public cloud, or we're only going to be sort of a SaaS service, you'd have gotten gotten some sort of wrinkled brows, like, eh, you're going to need to go on prem at some point. Now, you know, you look at Snowflake, you look at some others that you know have have sort of, you know, even Atlassian is pulling back away from being on prem, like. That mm -hmm. trend is that trend no longer looks like you're out of your you know like you're crazy to do that. It's like hey the the broader trend is moving away from on premises into the public cloud. Um, you know it it allows you to to focus. You know you you can optimize your platform for that type of, of use case, and it may not cover all of them, but it's not unusual anymore. I would think. Yeah, it's true. Atlassian is actually one of our customers, and we uh, it's great working with with people who are you know have the fo forward thinking, uh, sufficient forward, think forward thinking to be able to kind of be fully invested in the cloud. Uh, those are the folks who, whose opinions we really trust about, you know, what are they trying to do? What, you know, driving future roadmap requirements for us. And so, you know, Atlassian's become, and like the ML team there has become a real like thought partner for us as we continue to develop Tekton. So, uh, you know, the, the kind of cloud first organizations has been a pleasure to work with. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we see 
that more of the cloud first organizations partner with each other. They're sort of accelerating, sometimes helping each other accelerate. Um, let me wrap up and ask you sort of one last question. Obviously, you guys come from um, the background of some pretty sophisticated stuff out of out of Silicon Valley, you know, Google Ads, Uber and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you get, you get into the enterprise and, and while you obviously you work with some fairly sophisticated companies in that space, you also get ones who go, we'd like to get the power of everything that comes out of Silicon Valley, but you know, do we have the right people? How, how much do you find, you know, on maybe on a scale from one to 10, how sophisticated does somebody's data science team need to be to, to sort of harness the power of what Tekton delivers? And, and how do you help them kind of get, be successful if they're not a 10, you know, can they be a five or a three or a six or a seven and, and really kind of get the benefits of the platform? Yeah, great question. And, you know, we talked to we talk to fortune organizations who tell us, Hey, we don't want this. We don't want to buy a service that is only for our advanced data scientists or is only for our analysts or something like that. But we, you know, a real goal for us is to eliminate these silos. And we really are interested in having uh, a system that can be used as a set. So what we build is a central catalog, for all of the operational data pipelines, the feature pipelines in an, or, in an organization. But that can be uh, contributed to uh, and used by uh, a variety of personas. And so that's really what we focus on. You know, and the Michelangelo system uh, at Uber, similar story. You know, the, the kind of, there was a large data science community uh, at Uber, but, uh, you know, it, it ranged from people who or just, you know, recently learned SQL to people who are like literally math PhDs or math professors, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so we built these platforms for, for that large scope, uh, that whole spectrum of, of uh, skills. And so uh, a similar thing at Tekton. We're, we're building the platform for analysts, data scientists, and the ML engineers. And so uh, I think there's, you know, if you ask me like, hey, what? Wh- where it, what is the area that you uh, really want to kind of improve your support for over the next year? Certainly analysts. I think there's a lot more we can do there. I think we kind of uh, are, have a very strong offering for data science teams specifically right now. But, um, but we, the, the vision here is really to have the kind of same central platform that allows anybody to build anything offline, you, you know, build a, build a machine learning solution offline and have it uh, have it run in production, uh, but allow, you know, an analyst, a data scientist or an ML engineer to all use the same the same uh, underlying infrastructure. Maybe they interact with different interfaces to do that that are more, you know, tuned to their use cases um, to be able to run this stuff in production and uh, fully deploy ML uh, applications on their own. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, very cool. We, we 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 always love when folks are are understanding that there's there's this broad range of of kind of skills and so forth. And and the more you can kind of get closer to where people are today, than than them having to learn a lot of new things, it, it usually leads to great success. Uh, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go because I know you're busy you're busy doing stuff. Um, thank you so much. If folks want to engage with the team outside of maybe just uh, going to the Tekton homepage, what are the best ways to to learn about what you deliver, kind of, you know, maybe ask questions, kind of pick your brain about things? Uh, honestly, I think the Tekton homepage is where it's at. I'd also, um, you know, we have, we have a, a couple of blog posts that really describe what we do uh, in depth there and part of the vision. Uh, I would also, you know, if uh, people are thinking about some of these same challenges, um, you know, th- this is a really large space and I would suggest a, an online uh, community called ML Ops Community as the place where uh, where we've found that like some of the most vibrant discussions around machine learning and operational ML uh, are happening on the internet and that's a like a Slack channel with I don't know probably more than fifteen hundred people talking about this stuff all day so if you're so I, I, if you're if you're kind of working through some of these issues that's a pretty good place to get some ideas and support as well. Very cool. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll get a link to that in the show notes for folks. All right, with that, uh, you know, very very cool to see you know a couple of the trends we've been talking about all year. Not only 
uh, you know, ML becoming more and more important for for regular applications, um, you know, cloud first types of build out how, how things are being consumed and, uh, you know, obviously being reactive to, to all the interesting things going on in the world with, with COVID and everything else. So, Mike, with that, thank you so much for the time today, folks. I think we, we learned a lot about this. Um, with that, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to, uh, you know, thank you all for sharing the show with a friend, for helping us grow the community, for giving us feedback on iTunes and everywhere else you find the podcast. So with that, we will wrap up and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 